Thank you, Imam and Tepli, for joining the podcast. This is a long time coming. I'm a huge fan of yours. And you. for our audience uh, who don't know about you, just a little bit of a short introduction. I wanted to just tell them that you found the uh, Muslim leadership in the Shalom Hartman Institute, which over the last 10 years, you brought like about 150 Muslim leaders from America to Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and just to teach them about our, our history and our culture and our religion. And also you received the ADL ADL's award of the Daniel Pearl Award. So congratulations for that. And thank you for being such a friend um, and ally to the Jewish people. I want to, in this podcast, first learn about your life. Mm -hmm. um, starting out as a young boy in Turkey, from a sec you were from a secular family. Right. And you're obviously, because of that, you know, you your, your background, you were exposed to kind of a, a specific view about Jews um, and I want to just know more about your upbringing. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And kudos to this incredible project, uh, Judaism Demystified. Uh, I didn't know anything about it until you reached out to me. I really wish there will be similar uh, projects about uh, Islam Demystified or Christianity Demystified or Ju Jewish-Muslim relations Demystified, which we are going to try in the yes. next hour or so. Yes, regretfully, the very secular, nationalist, chauvinistically racist upbringing uh, exposed me to a very sophisticated uh, anti-Semitic propaganda that uh, I spent a good chunk of my teenage years swallowing um, anti-Semitic propaganda. But again, I have to emphasize, it was very secular. It was in the context of Turkish nationalism. Uh, and... Um, the first book I ever read about anything related to Judaism, Zionism, or Israel was the children's version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the infamous, despicable, disgusting uh, Russian anti-Semitic hate literature. And then I immediately read Henry Ford's, our own American anti-Semite of 1920s and 30s, uh, International Jew, which is regretfully still common and translate it into every possible languages. And before 15, I must have read at least three, four times Mein Kampf. So when I say I grew up in an incredibly uh, toxic, poisonous, anti-Semitic environment, I don't mean just mild bias. I was made to believe that Judaism as religion, Jews as people are irredeemably evil, and they are behind any and every problem, suffering, difficulty, and calamities that Muslims or Turks uh, uh, facing. And one has to understand because hate is terrible, racism is disgusting. Not many people really understand why it works. I grew up uh, 12, 13 year old opening my eyes to the world and I've been told two stories. We were a great nation and civilization once upon a time. We ruled the world, Ottoman Empire, Muslim civilizations have risen and they have held the enlightenment for many, many centuries. And then the second thing, everything around you fails. Everything around you perpetually um, loses. Um, you are a member of the team that always loses. You see every other people's nation's flags are on top. Your flag is on the bottom. So you try to make sense of this glorious past and an incredibly painful present. Why is my people perpetually losing? why I'm sitting on a pile of anger, nothing around me works. Um, and here's a very sophisticated propaganda. That's the power, unfortunately, seductive power of hate of any kind. It very convincingly turns these complicated realities, social, political, cultural, historical realities, and it gives you a very convincing, comforting, black and white, reductionist, simple answers. Muslims are failing, Turkey and Turks are failing because of this cursed, evil people, cancerous in the brain tissues of humanity, trying to dominate the world innately, inherently an uh, enemy of Islam, trying to humiliate the Muslim community. What saved me, and I can give more details of, the, of those my uh, anti-Semitic years, I don't know if you have seen Yair Rosenberg of Atlantic, last Yom Kippur, he wrote a beautiful Yom Kippur message about my recovery from my anti-Semitism. Yes. I, I told that. him about the story and I I joking about two years ago said, thank God in, in 1980s there were no smartphones. Like if my anti-Semitism 
the number of burning Israeli right flag incidents were recorded, and if my anti-Semitism was immortalized, I don't know if I could have ever recovered. It could have been much more difficult. The fact that uh, I was able to get exposed to so many redeeming healing powers, mainly through my religion, and my anti-Semitism was not publicly recorded, I was given this opportunity and chance. These days, it's much harder, especially when you make everything public through social media, it becomes in your permanent record. What saved me is really becoming Muslim, becoming serious about my religion uh, and getting fascinated with Islam. And I was lucky enough that my early teachers, my early yeshivas, Muslim madrasas, they were teaching, you can't learn about the scripture interpretation, Quran or the Prophet Muhammad. First, you have to build a moral and ethical dashboard. They taught ethics before they taught me anything. And if the good functional moral dashboard is built, it will give you the right flags, right alarms, right messages saying the, the kind of poison that you have swallowed is not reconcilable with the ethical moral commitments of Islam, central ethical moral teachings of Islam. And I was confronted my religion's moral critique of what I thought of Judaism and Jews and Israel and Zionism that took me and that led me into an inquiry. And part of that religious knowledge, not only was ethics, but also I studied Jewish-Muslim relations. Mm -hmm. It was very different than the propaganda that I have received. I was made to believe that we were at, uh, we were at each other's throat the whole time. We were destined to be enemies. Muhammad always, peace be upon him, had hostile relationship with the Jewish community. And then when you really read the mainstream historical records, Muhammad had incredibly good relationship with his contemporary Jewish communities. Yes. He married to two Jewish women. One of them converted to Islam on the day of the wedding, Safiya. And Rayhana, the second wife, she never, never converted, remained as Jew, died as a Jewish woman. So the whole idea of my poisonous anti-Semitic mind, the prophet of Islam that I now love and adore and admire, had Jewish in-laws. He attended Shabbat services. He ate kosher food. He also he had, fought a battle. Didn't he fight a battle with a Jew? That uh, forgot his name, but uh, he fought a famous battle with with a Jew who was by his side, who stood by him for you know. Who was yes, born. yes. In the in the in the infamous uh, second consequence, Muhammad has been involved in three self defense wars. In the mm -hmm. second one, oh, he was a rabbi actually. Mm -hmm. He yes. died, and the prophet honored him as a as a martyr because he died on the, there were nine to 12 different records of Jewish tribes in the, yeah. in, the in the in Muhammad's Medina. And yeah. almost all of them except one, they fought in building an ethical moral city state with, with Muhammad side by side. You are correct. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious to know, because a lot, a lot of people will make the, a lot of Jews will make the argument that what is the point of, let's say, trying to bridge um, the gap between ourselves in other communities, the Christians and the Muslims, when in their, from their perspective, they find verses that seem to indicate that the hatred of Jews is baked into the religion. It would be baked into Islam or it would be baked into, um, you know, Christianity where it says like the synagogue of Satan or Islam, where it says in the Quran, you know, like the, the descendants of apes and pigs, obviously those can be taken way out of context, but um, what do you have to say about those kind of things? Sure. sure. First of all, let's recognize the partial truth in that statement. There are anti-Semitic Quranic verses, there are anti-Semitic incidents in the life of Prophet Muhammad. Those exist. But of all people Jews know, or Judaism know, you don't pull one verse of Torah and build a whole religion, build a whole theology. Our traditions are so incredibly, remarkably similar. Uh, there's a culture of disagreement and very rich debate and interpretation. This is one. Secondly, I think a lot of those statements are coming from rather misleading comparison of Christian anti-Semitism to Muslim anti-Semitism. People who really know and understand and regretfully suffered and endured to Christian anti-Semitism, they know those anti-Semitic elements, Jesus's Jewish identity, his crucifixion, and the alleged role of the Jewish community leaders in his crucifixion and his, uh, his death. Those stories, those anti-Semitic stories and scriptural uh, elements within the New Testament, especially when Christianity became an institutionalized religion, those anti-Semitic elements 
they were not just anti-Semitic elements. They moved into the center of Christianity. They captured the soul of Christian faith and Christian theology, so much so that that incident, symbol, that symbol became the symbol of Christianity. What is the symbol of Christianity? It's the Jesus on the cross. And that story, this is not a conviction to entire Christianity, all Christians. But if you cannot connect the Jesus on the cross to Holocaust, that means you miss the whole point. That's where it is cooked or embedded as the questions uh, came. Antisemitism is, is moved to the heart and soul of Christianity. People think similarly the antisemitic elements in the Quran or the Hadith is the same or they carry similar amount of power. That is far from being true. Those antisemitic elements for two main reasons, which I will explain in a minute, they were always kept until 1948 in the peripheries and the outskirts of Islamic theology. Those elements, those imagination, those narratives, anti-Semitic stories, they were kept at uh, on leash at bay. And they only episodically, when there was a conflict, episodic conflict within Jewish and Muslim communities, they sort of moved towards the center. But thankfully, thank God, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Allah, as we say, it was always kept as marginal voices. Uh, and in such a tragic way, maybe at some point we should discuss and compare Christian anti-Semitism with Muslim anti-Semitism, sure. the, the history is reversing itself. Christianity has pumped this central anti-Jewish hatred for about 2,000 years regularly. Christian anti-Semitism, it, it faced very little to no challenges. It, it, it moved 100 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. But after Holocaust, it took Holocaust, it is, at least in the West, has been reversing and declining. And we had some relative success in defeating Western Christian anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in such an ironic and paradoxical way, and the Muslim anti-Semitism is going in the opposite direction. The 1400 years before 1948, uh, Muslim anti-Semitism was kept under control as a viral infection. There was enough ethical, moral, uh, pressures put on them that it never had a chance to flourish uh, because of the toxicity of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Unfortunately, it's manifesting itself very similar to Christian anti-Semitism and moving to the center. How did Muslims tame? How did Muslims control and quarantine these anti-Semitic elements within, within the foundational uh, developmental materials, canonical texts of our religion is to uh, Quran, in addition to those anti-Semitic elements, maybe hundreds of more times, it reveres Jews and Judaism. It reveres a fellow monotheistic religion. And according to Islam, as far as we are concerned, Islam is nothing but a direct theological continuation of uh, Judaism. Yes, in a, way, in a way, Jews feel like uh, Islam, many Jews feel that Islam is kind of like a Noahidic uh, extension of Judaism, where it's kind of like Judaism for the non-Jews, in a way. Uh, so not too much. I always make a joke, which will, I will not do it here. There are some sects of Judaism, there are some offshoots of Judaism, still within the fold of greater Jewish world. I think Islam is much closer, theologically and normatively, in terms of its legal uh, uh, part. Uh, Islam is closer to Judaism than some of these offshoots of uh, Jewish religion or Jewish Jewish tradition. I totally agree, and I'm going to get myself in trouble if I get into the details. But <laughs> I would but, argue, yeah. for example, I'm not going to use any denominational labels, but some of the very reformist, non-traditional wings of Judaism, uh, what the traditional Judaism share with that wing of that chapter of Judaism, they are as uh, they are as Jewish as anybody can be. I'm not judging their Judaism. But I think traditional Islam and traditional Judaism would share a lot more in common. The same struggle, uh, we at Duke University recently with the Chabad community, mm -hmm. I partnered with the Chabad community, I don't know if you saw, and we created the first fully Orthodox portion and halal food truck on Duke campus. Oh, wow. Very nice. I want to share a recent article. I hope you can share with your audience as well. Sure. Absolutely. So when I see a very practicing Muslim student having conversation with an observant Jewish student uh, in their belief in this living God, that God is part of our life and God manifests in everything, including our food. 
including mm -hmm. our uh, daily life, including our consumption habits. Religion is not confined to the four walls of a house of worship. It manifests itself through ethical, moral principles, every aspect of your life. Uh, I just a couple of days ago saw a hijabi Muslim woman who is delighted uh, because there's not food that she, she can eat, having a conversation with a graduate student. And they talk about the Judaism and Islam's rituals in terms of uh, how you go to the bathroom and what do you do there and how you clean yourself and what kind of prayers you offer to God Almighty. It is so similar. It is like you feel right at home. You feel right at home. Yes, absolutely. And I wish more people would know this. Like even, even Sharia, um, it, which means, you know, like it's the same meaning as halakha. Halakha in Judaism, which is law, is is the path. Right. And, and, so, and yeah, and there's also other things, you know, like you mentioned madrasa comes from the word bet midrash, which is Hebrew, which is exactly. the, 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 right? So all these things and chag, we have chag, which is the holidays. You have hajj and the Egyptian Muslims say chag also. So it's the That's same right. thing. There's so many That's similarities. Right. And you guys do hakafot. You go around seven times around the, the Kaaba and we, you know, we, we, on, on Sukkot, we do the same thing. It's 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 such a... Yeah, Jewish, Jewish wedding, seven blessings. Yes, yes, uh, yes. That, that, that go through the same cycle. So what kept anti-Semitic elements within Islamic tradition in control, at check, filtered constantly, is this enormous similarity, which we can talk more, in terms of Judaism and Islam. Again, these are two distinct religions. I'm not saying we are all the same. We are very distinct religions. But there is no any other religion in its own ethical and moral frame of reference is similar than the Judaism and Islam in its traditional form. And then the second thing is the Jewish Muslim history. Yes. Because Muhammad set the tone in such a healthy way. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't egalitarian. It wasn't 21st century participatory egalitarian society. It was hierarchical. Uh, but compared to Jewish experience in Europe for the last 2,000 years, there is nothing, absolutely nothing comparable to these regular programs, uh, bloody Good Fridays, Palm Sundays, lynchings, and absolutely nothing like Holocaust. Why? Um, it's not because Muslims were innately inherently more peaceful than the Christian Europeans, but the tradition and history, imagination, about who we are in relation to our Jewish brothers and sisters was so centrally powerful that it kept it kept those anti-Semitic elements uh, quarantined and they never had any oxygen to grow and become a monster that it has become in the Christian tradition. Yes, you know, also, um, I think the fact that the Prophet Muhammad uh, has met, has he mentioned Moses, he references Moses as yeah. the most repeated Prophet, more so, he appears more times in the Quran than than Muhammad himself. Muhammad is mentioned by name in the Quran only one time. Yes. Whereas Moses, uh, he's the most mentioned person by name, 147 times. There you go. So yeah, so you got the stats behind it. So yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a uh, a lot to what you said. And as somebody who I come from the we mentioned off camera, but I come from the um, Shadi uh, community, which are my great grandparents and their generation, they were forced converts uh, to Shia Islam for uh, over a century and kept their Judaism in private. Part of the benefit of being living in, in Muslim lands, even as difficult as it gets sometimes, if it got difficult, we were able to kind of maintain our identity to some, to some extent because of the fact that um, we can pray inside of a mosque. We pray to the same God, Allah, Whereas in Ashkenazi lands, they a lot of times chose death because they felt that Christianity is idolatry, and there's there's icons in in the churches and crosses and idols. Or and, the Trinitarian language was so yes. antithetical to the radical monotheism that Islam and Judaism uh, center itself around. It was such a foreign language. It's similar, Muslims had no difficulty in praying in the. Uh, synagogues, uh, but it was always a challenge in the in the in the churches. So therefore, if we, if I can quickly wrap up the question, why yeah. to even bother? Antisemitism is baked into the heart of Islam and Christianity is absolutely not true. That one can make an argument in the Christianity. I think uh, no one, no religion should be judged based on one or two texts 
in their canonical scriptures. Judaism is not what Torah says, what Talmud says. Christianity is not what New Testament says. Quran is not what Muslim, Islam or Muslims are. Islam is not what Quran says only. Right. You have to look in a broad uh, spectrum of the years. How did these texts, how did these teachings manifest it over the centuries and judge by the history? Yes. Like if, if it was, I am telling you, this is the last thing I will say. Yeah. If it was baked into the system, Quranically, Muslim halakhically, we were meant to slaughter all the Jews. We had more than, more than uh, uh, many opportunities to do so right. for 1400 years. There is no reason Muslims could have committed the similar genocides that took place in Europe in much because we run the show for 1400 years in absolute hegemony and political economic power. If it was we were wired that way, we had ample opportunities. That is theologically not accurate, historically not accurate, but also there is no scientific evidence that that is the case. Well, that's really an amazing thing that you uh, said right now. And um, I I want to hear a little bit more about Islam because um, I'm fascinated by it. I see that in our tradition, in Jewish tradition, you know, um, we, I think what I want to add one more thing to what you said. Context also matters because if we have to, if we, let's say, look at the Talmud, there are some, like you said, there are some statements in there that could be taken out of context. Like, Whoa, that's terrible. You can't trust the non-Jews. And this, a lot of that said, because look who was brutalizing them at the time. You know, and there, there, there's, there's a lot of times where we just, we can't just cherry pick, you know, and th say this is, this is for all time. It's not absolutely. It's not Joshua's but, entrance to the Holy Land. Just read that chapter. Yes. That was my children's verses, though the Protocols of Elders of Zion. Right. They were taking these verses from Joshua's entrance and yes. putting under the pictures of Palestinian children and women who were casualties of the conflict, making right. the connection in a similar way. So yeah. if you don't want to be treated by the literal, uh, no context, mm -hmm. literal meaning of few scriptures, don't do this onto others if you don't want to be treated in the same way. So and it's, it's understandable to a certain extent in a post 9 11 United States, mm -hmm. uh, but it always baffles me. I give these talks. I've been to more synagogues than most Jews I know. And then people would say, like, your religion is violent. It says, kill the Jews, et cetera. And my religion says nothing like that. I said, do you want to do some Devara Torah with me? I can study some Torah with you. <laughs> even, even with what I know, I can tell you that's not the case. Yeah. Every religion has those elements. We should yeah. be judged by what did we do with these elements? Yes, yes. Did we, it's, it's, did it's we lock them up? Yes. Or did we do Tashua, Toba, yes. after those viruses uh, broke out in our system? How did we react to our ethical moral failures vis-a-vis -vis hate? That should be our measure of judgment. And, um, you know, philosophy in general is like, what is, we see that in, in is Judaism, let's say, for example, a philosophy, we see that it is because it's always pointing to an ideal. It's pointing to what the world ought to be, right? And there is an idealistic kind of utopian world that we want to build. And I feel like that's what all the religions seem to point to, that we have that place that we all want to be at, hopefully. Um, I want to ask you a question about, you know, in your own community, because you probably get a lot of, you know, death threats and uh, criticism and ostracization. Um, there, how did, how did they respond to what you're saying? Let's say your community members. Um, how and do you approach this as Islam, for example, needs to be reformed or just needs to be moderated? How how do you approach, uh, you know, what Islam is for the 21st century Muslim? I don't see religion as in general, uh, especially Islam, as a static, frozen, something that's been cooked 1400 years ago and nothing could be changed. That is just absurd. That's the whole idea. If you believe in the living God, we read the whole Quran every Ramadan, every year, because in the last 11 months, we are a different people. We had a different experience. We gained new lenses, new, new prisms have opened to us, new technological and scientific inventions. So we go back to reread the Quran again and again, because we change, human experience change. To me, religion is vertical uh, revelation from God, but horizontal engagement 
human beings' engagement with that revelation over and over again as we change, as we grow, as our as the horizons of our imagination expand almost every day, especially in this modern modern day. So change is absolutely the case. However, that change should be in conversation, in respect and admiration of that vertical revelation as well. I reject, categorically reject, of any call for reformation that disrespect that tradition. Uh, there is a way in which we can observe the continuity as we strive for necessary changes. That's what, that's what religion is all about. Therefore, uh, that kind of Western Eurocentric Islam needs a Martin Luther or that needs to go through. It is such a bizarre and foreign language. I don't even understand that you can make clear distinction between what is religious and what is secular. There is nothing secular about my life, my water, my food, my conversation, my relationship with my family. It's all within the realm of my religion. Like how, how would I make that separation so that I can reform some part, etc. This is this is not the right right way to go. But of course, Muslim intellectual thought that engagement with the divine revelation is not working as good as it's supposed to be because we have a lot of problem in the horizontal level. When civilizations and societies are economically, socially, politically, culturally thriving, when liberties are uh, in abundance, of course that civilization revealed the best of any aspect of that society. But if the, if the, if the societies, which is the case with a lot of Muslim majority of societies are deeply broken in every possible way. They reveal the worst of worst of uh, that, that civilization. So what needs to be fixed is not Islam. What needs to be fixed is Muslims. Because if these societies are thriving economies, like many developed countries, you will see the difference. Why I came to the United States, because I practice Islam much more freely much more authentically than any other Muslim majority countries. What Muslim majority countries are experiencing today is over maybe 200, 300 years of gradual decline since the 17th, 18th century. Muslim civilizations ultimately collapsed by the end of the First World War at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. And now Muslim societies are trying to bounce back bounce back from this civilization collapse. But still in the thick of a 21st century or 20th century, a dark ages. This is not an insult to my people. This is a fact that our, our Muslim civilizations, like all civilizations, they rise, they get steady and they decline and they collapse. Muslim civilizations are experiencing a modern, a version of a modern dark age. Therefore, all the ugliness, barbarism, bloodshed in the name of Islam or primitiveness, backwardness in the name of Islam is a reflection of Muslims and, and those societies need to be helped to regain their civilizational health uh, as, we, as we try to improve the intellectual Islamic thought. It's interesting because, you know, part of what I do with Judaism Demystified, I'm just a regular guy, I'm not a rabbi, imam, but, um, you know, I see an issue in, within Judaism with fundamentalism and being, you know, some people being stuck in a specific time period um, and kind of like having a shtetl mentality, whereas yeah. you know, the, the world is changing and we have to adapt to the changes, but we don't need to, you know, um, change our religion in order. We just have to actually return to fundamentals. That's actually what our podcast is about is about going back to the way it was before all these denominations and splits and sects and, you know, right. labels. Um, Ju Judaism and Islam actually, I think, share in that way, because I think religiously, um, we're both kind of, I, don't, I wouldn't say this is the greatest period of, of, of Jewish uh, religion, per se, maybe in some areas it is. But um, in terms of like innovation and technology and impact on the world and civilization, I feel like this is the peak of, of Jewish history. Um, and unfortunately, it's not necessarily aligned with the religious aspect of it. So, although not, in Israel, yet, not, not yet, one would not hope. Yet. Not yet. yet, inshallah. You would think um, Jews going back to their ancestral land and building a thriving economy, uh, and then North American Jews, like two homes, it's never, it's unheard of in the whole history that two thriving Jewish communities 
Uh, I hope we will contribute more. It already has, but we will contribute more, more to the depth of ethical moral teachings of Judaism. So I don't think you being, uh, you know, kind of uh, pro-Jewish is really controversial. I think you being pro-Israel in a way is controversial because, um, you know, the from the Palestinian side of things, they're, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to hear what you're saying or maybe they don't see what you're saying is to be let's say true or... yeah, i wouldn't i wouldn't even make that statement ben um you know when you say they we are talking about the whole people those generalizations often lead us to some misunderstanding as well yes. many do and some they were never given an opportunity to hear one of the most beautiful ways in which judaism and islam does is it trains our ears so that we can hear the voice of god we can hear the voice of Sinai. We can hear the voice of Muazzin. Uh, so their ears are not trained. Part of, the, part, of, part of it is our responsibility. That's why I work and do everything that I can to make sure our, our fundamental ethical moral teachings in Judaism and Islam is so strong. If you can expose our people to those rich uh, ethical moral tradition, they will see that this whole political fight over land, over this and over that is meaningless. But I'm talking about mainly from like a historical perspective. They're kind of taught, and I'm not saying, I'm saying they generally, it's probably, it's obviously incorrect to say, to judge them generally, but um, that let's say, for example, Israel was never the, um, belonged to the Israelis, even going back to ancient times, because right. It was always called. It was called Palestine, and the truth of the matter is, if they study history, um, and they're being taught, if they study, if they study Quran, they don't have to. They exactly. don't have to exactly. they study the Quran. It's just uh, that denial. Uh, sort of, uh, I see in many aspect in many communities. One of the ways in which we we do so much uh, injustice to our own religion is to deny the other people, deny the there are no Palestinian people. They were never, there was never a Palestinian people or Jews had no historical, biblical, religious connection to the land. These are denials and very childish and it's both a manifestation sides. of both, both moral sides. corruption. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely happening on both sides. And even today, Jews in America who are kind of experiencing this new form of anti-Semitism, which is denying our identity. Oh, you're not even the real Jews. You're like the right. fake Jews. Um, so I, I definitely relate to that. But the reason why I'm concerned about this is because it's kind of the core issue of like, can this problem be solved? Uh, because, for example, the other Arab nations we see, there's amazing peace happening and, and happening, um, ama an amazing thing that's happening in the UAE and with uh, soon to be the Saudi Arabia peace, peace treaty. Oh, yeah. But with the Palestinians, as much as we would like it, it's almost as if like the the main issue is our identity. And how do we get past that point of like, okay, let's have a conversation without all of these kind of distractions? I highly recommend you and the audience of this podcast to read uh, my holy brother, my main partner in Jewish Muslim relations, Yossi Klein Halevi's uh, most recent book, The Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant project. You're absolutely right. This conflict is not about land, it's not about borders, it's not about refugees, it's about our core identities. And I think you'll see in that book, by explaining the core ethical moral commitments of Zionist Jewish identity and expecting a reciprocal decency to be understood in the same way is a very, very successful project. He and I, we were in Morocco recently, uh, another country that Israel thankfully has established peace and good relationship. And it's really incredible. Once people are given an opportunity, the, how in Saudi Arabia, in UAE, in, Bah in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia hasn't even formally joined yet. But if you give them a little bit of an opportunity and suspend the toxicity of the uh, polarizing, divisive political conversation, you see the innate goodness of the people are emerging in incredible speed and scale. And, um, you know, I think that one of the reasons that I see this kind of positive development that's happening um, in the UAE, for example, is because they're being exposed. Like a lot of videos I see is that like they're lighting the menorah with the Jewish people and they're and the rabbis are talking to the imams and they're they're actually learning about each other and from both sides. Everybody's kind of learning about each other, um, which is an amazing thing. And 
now I actually want to lead to the next part because I want our audience who for now are mostly Jewish, but hopefully we'll get Muslim and, and Christian and other, you know, listeners. Sure. If, um, I want to understand from your perspective, what is Islam? What does it mean to you? Um, and how is it similar to Judaism? I'm, I'm the, one th the one thing I actually want to start with is the idea of monotheism, the idea of the belief in one God, which is really the foundation of, let's say, the greatest country that ever was created, America. Um, it was built upon this idea that we're all men that were created equally under God. Um, this groundbreaking idea of monotheism has impacted the world tremendously. How has that influenced you? And how do you feel like that would be the answer to the modern um, young person's uh, struggle with, you know, growing up spiritually in America? Sure. First, I would like to agree and emphasize what you just said, uh, that that oneness of God and manifesting in the oneness of humanity is at the heart of Islam. And what I'm about to say doesn't make Islam better than Judaism or Christianity or any other religion. But world's almost all religions are named after either named after their founders, like Buddhism, like Christianity, or they are named after the geographies, the part of the world that they came from, like Judaism, like Hinduism. This oneness of God and one's ability to relate to that one, one God and be in love, uh, be in a loving relationship with the God is so central to Muslim imagination, Muslim thinking across the world, that the religion is named after that quality. Islam is the only religion named after neither by Muhammad nor Saudi Arabia or Arabian Peninsula, where it was originated historically speaking. It was named after this one quality that this life is a temporary uh, space and time, and we are expected to be seeking God's fingerprints, God's impact, God's signature in our lives, and try to be in a willing, loving uh, submission to the will of God, living an ethical, moral life. That's what Islam is. That's what religion in general is, is for me. And as a Muslim, who is believing in you know, the oneness of God, what would you say to your university professor in Duke? So you, you're dealing with young people who are kind of living in the age where God is an, almost an afterthought. And we see the ramifications yes. of a world without God. And we're starting to see how things are thrown into chaos. What is it? What is your pitch to young people uh, to come, not even to Islam, but just to God, to understanding God and are connecting to him. What are the benefits of that? Why is this better? Why is this a better alternative to atheism or agnosticism? One of, the, one of the ways in which I always teach religion, but especially Islam is, I always start most of my classes with the following statement, that the ultimate goal of God, ultimate desire of God, you can never know, I think for me, was not to create a perfect religion was not to create a perfect set of belief systems or rituals. That wasn't, the, God wasn't trying to perfect a organized religion per se. I think the ultimate, ultimate desire of God was to create perfect human being, a perfect soul and perfect societies consist of perfect human beings. So if that is the definition of religion, as I believe very, very strongly, the religions have almost a utilitarian value in getting you to that perfection, in achieving that individual and collective ethical moral standards. That should be the case of religion. Historically, in order to really extract meaning and uh, develop ethical moral muscles, it required a very traditional and strict observation. When I became fascinated by Islam, in an unambiguous language, I was told, in order to really get the most out of this religion, you have to sign up the membership form, you have to be obedient, you have to be pious, you have to learn Arabic and Persian, you have to pray this many times, you have to fast that many times, and that's good. That's my life now. I love it. It worked. But I think for a lot of younger generations who are skeptical, rightfully skeptical of organized religion, without slipping into relativism, without necessarily cheapening and flattening down these particularisms of our religion, there is a much bigger and broader opportunity, especially in the West, that they can really tap into this millennium-long accumulated wisdom and knowledge and spirituality 
with being member of one particular religion and exploring and learning from all or being member of no religion. These wisdom of God through these ethical moral faith tradition is now more accessible. It is, it is, it is a lot more transparent. I invite them with a quench, with an unquenchable thirst. Read first. Don't sign any membership. Don't. And say no to those who are demanding membership for wisdom. God is love. God is just. God is merciful. But all this mercy, love, and compassion is based on your membership signature. That is bizarre. That is boxing God in such a small place, which is a kid. Hashem, which is desecrating God's name. So what I tell the young people is, you will never escape from the big, profound, monumental questions of life. You will never be able to answer the desires of the soul, the death, the love, the sadness. There is so much metaphysical realities mm. in an unseen world that you need to be able to decode, you need to be able to comprehend here is a here is an incredible tradition giving you the tools and now not demanding obedience not demanding strict membership take advantage of this relationship this opportunity yeah i think uh, also people make the mistake to say oh the jews call themselves the, the chosen people but in the torah it's really the choosing people we the ones who choose the torah but judaism is not an exclusive religion we believe that um anybody can have the same uh, reward uh, so to speak, uh, we we believe that God, when He gave Adam, He blew His breath into Adam. It was the Father of all mankind, not the Father of all Jews, um, and that's why we don't we don't see converts because we believe that every person can attain this. It's it's not an exclusive thing. So that's why we see a lot of kinship with with our Muslim brother, our cousins. I have to say, I admire. I really, really. There are many holy envies because I'm an ardent student of Judaism. I am a senior fellow at an Israeli Jewish organization. I learn a lot about Judaism. My number one holy envy, holy je jealousy about Judaism is Shabbat. Nothing, nothing can supersede the power of Shabbat. I think that would be a huge gift if Judaism could translate the meaning, the depth of Shabbat, as Abraham Joshua Heschel in his famous book does. The world needs this experience. Absolutely. I think another aspect is Judaism, especially Christianity and Islam can learn a lot about Judaism's very comfortable take on God's grace, that God, anybody and everybody can receive God's grace. You know, I have never seen anything like the number obsession of the Muslims and the uh, Christians. You go to church, if somebody is converting, that's the most emotional time of the year for them. If you go to a mosque, somebody converting, as if we lack in numbers. Yeah. Nothing electrifies the Christian and the Muslim communities than conversion in many cases. Here is a tradition, even though many uh, social media celebrities has more followers than the Jews, entire Jewish community in the world, even though their numbers are not great, but they still yet maintain this skeptical, sober, critical take on conversion and not obsessed with just adding more numbers to your community and inviting us to reflect on what is more important than just building mega communities or numbers. Uh, you want quality, you want quality, quality yeah. or quantity. Um, actually, to those people who say, you know, like, like you mentioned before, who won, which religion won, there's no winning and losing because truth has never been a numbers game. You know, Abraham, the father of all of our religions, was one man among the rest of the world who believed in pagan ideas and idolatry. And he was the one man who understood the truth. So it was never about the numbers from the beginning. Um, and, and, and often when I speak to the Jewish communities, I get this question. Well, you are nice and wonderful, but one person. You are a fig leaf Muslim mm -hmm. who's somehow fascinated with Judaism, Jews, Israel, and Zionism, but you are not represented. And I say to them, maybe quantitatively, that's exactly what you're talking about. But uh, remember that biblical Quranic and the, uh, in the Torah and the Quran, there's a scene of Abraham, where Abraham is on one side of the river yes. and everybody else is on the other side of the river. And I always say, who remembers the names of the people on the other side of the river? 
Who remembers them? Who are they? This, they were in much greater number. But half of humanity, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, today remembers Abraham, honors Abraham, his family, his generosity, his connection and devotion and love of God and humanity. So it's never numbers game. It's never, never numbers game. So that will be a great segue for our, our last segment. Um, I wanted to talk about this singular figure who impacted my life and my co-host who's not able, who wasn't able to make it to this episode, but he, we were very much influenced by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Um, he was a very powerful influence and I know you were friends with him. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with him and also in your talk with him, you mentioned something, uh, a, a new song. We were talking about a new song. I don't know if you recall. Um, I can do. Tell, can you tell I our do. audience uh, about this? I do. Not only I do. Uh, Shiru Adonai Shir Khadash. That's that's pretty much my entire Islam, my entire work now. Partially because we are running away, like it is no secret, from our nightmares. Uh, violence, racism, hate, death and destruction often in the names of our religion is going out of control. If something keep going wrong, in especially in the ethical moral scoreboard, and in the wisdom of Rabbi Einstein, Albert Einstein, if you keep doing the same thing and expecting him, say, a different result, that means that you're just insane. Basically, that's the definition of insanity. We need the new songs because things are not going well ethically and morally. It might be going well technologically, economically, materialistically, but um, the soul of Islam and Judaism is facing enormous amount of challenges. And in some areas, it's just getting worse and worse. Just the last week um, in the Holy Land, all the tragic death and despicable terrorism, people are being killed and murdered on the way to a shul synagogue on a Friday night. Innocent people in refugee camps being killed and murdered in a, as part of a military operation. So anybody who is seeing these current situation deteriorating very rapidly, they have to ask themselves, that means some of the songs that we are singing is not working anymore. When God says to David, Shiru Adonai Shir Khadash, God is partially in my own uh, Midrash saying, because some of the old songs that David you are singing is not a delight to my ears anymore. It's not working. Mm -hmm. But it's not only nightmares. We are not only... When I talk this uh, in this way to Rabbi John, late Jonathan Sachs, may his memory be a blessing. My only regret is I only got to know him two years before he died. I wish I knew him before. I would have benefited from his wisdom, he, the depth of his scholarship, more importantly, the depth of his wisdom and, and oceans of morality he was able to pack in, in his life. And, but also I could have done really incredible work with him. And uh, I said to him, when I told him, it's not only the nightmares are forcing us to sing some new songs, opportunities. We can glorify God's name as two minority faith traditions in the West, Judaism and Islam, can bring our complementary strengths together and lift up humanity, lift up God's names in such a powerful way. There are endless opportunities. I remember him tearing up. I remember him choking up. This is absolutely the case. We are... We are commanded. If you don't hear the voice from Sinai or Mecca, that means something is wrong with your ears. Otherwise, that voice is screaming for some new discourse in Jewish-Muslim relations, new type of relationship in service of God and humanity from the contemporary Jews and Muslims, especially from Jews and Muslims in the West, especially in North America, where we are here, where certain type of relationships, certain type of conversations and partnerships are possible. Whereas in the Middle East, because of war and all these, all these tragic developments in the last hundred years, even a handshake is a problem. But here we can have these kind of conversations. Yeah. That's why it's a greater moral imperative. It's a greater moral responsibility for us to take advantage of this. I cannot say enough good things about Rabbi Sachs, but let me tell you one thing. He once, uh, we were talking about Abraham and his generosity, his hospitality. He and his wife said, when he was the chief rabbi, there was not a single Shabbat ever that there were no guests around his Shabbat table. Every single Shabbat, when he was the chief rabbi of all those years, there were always some guests. 
And I said, then my teacher, my rabbi, who were the Muslims around that Shabbat table? Hmm. He couldn't remember one. He couldn't, and his wife couldn't remember either because she is, uh, she is the one who's setting at the table for the most part. She's in charge of the more important thing. And, and he also said, I wish we could have met earlier that I had, I could have had Muslims around my, and I asked the same question to a lot of my Jewish friends uh, and the Muslim friends. If you feel so strongly, and if you think you are so open-minded and uh, you want to do good for the people, then how many Jews you invited to your iftar tables? How many Jews you brought to your mosque? Uh, there are so many, not simplistic, but simple tasks, easy tasks that we can take yes. to heal and unite the wounded and divide the Jewish Muslim relations that we are not taking advantage. He came to Duke, we hosted him for three days. It was a it was an ethical, moral, intellectual uh, pleasure feast for me and I think for him as well. And we remain in touch, but soon after he went back, he got sick. But I've been reading nonstop his, his writings and I've been listening to his lectures. He continues to teach from his heavenly mansion. Mm -hmm. And I hope I can be a faithful and loyal student to him by at least fulfilling some of his dreams on Jewish Muslim relations. He never had a chance in his own life. I hope you, me, and others, we can, he can live through our own fulfillment of those bridge building efforts between our communities. Amen. And I, and I see you as the Rabbi Sachs of the Muslim world. So um, what you're doing- oh, is That's a tall order. That no, is a very tall definitely order. definitely doing it. I and can only live a life, aspire to achieve that. But I'm turning 50 next month. I may have a few more decades, inshallah, God willing, inshallah. try my best. Inshallah. And I, I, I'm proud to say that I grew up in a house where my, we always had full Shabbat table. And my father, he worked uh, a lot with, uh, you know, Dubai, UAE and Bahrain and all these people. So he has, we've had a lot of actually Muslims at our Shabbat table. Um, and that, Those, that's one of the most amazing things. And know, I must that's, say very, that's very rare. It's very rare. It's very rare. rare. I must very, say. Very rare they the ones we've been let's say invited to their homes they're they have the one thing that 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 i feel like many jews have which is uh the 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 abrahamic teaching of being you know bringing uh, guests into your home M muslims are so hospitable like it's such an amazing quality uh, that you guys have and i think that there's so, so much we can learn from each other and there's so much we have in common so if uh you know the last message um i want to leave um, everybody is a prayer that we can all, God willing, uh, bring peace to the world. And what we're doing right now, Bezrat Hashem, Inshallah, we should we should have a lot of good things and only happiness and success and learn from each other and have only blessings. And um, I'm not I'm not very good at this, but I hope that. Uh, oh no, you are doing a wonderful job, Ben. You can You're also understanding yourself. You could make a wonderful Imam and a Shul <laughs> Rabbi. Uh, I'm into your prayers. Let's let's keep working as hard as at least minimum. Let's work as hard as people who are trying to divide us. Yes. As hard as those who are trying to pump hatred, exclusion, unwelcome into our hearts. I sign up to all the anti-Semitic and Islamophobic email listeners because it motivates me. I that's my ethical moral commitment. I look at how hard they are working to tear us apart how hard they are working to corrupt Judaism and Islam and desecrating God's name in the name of Judaism and Islam. I, I have to work at least that hard, if not harder. Looking forward to the conversation Yes. in right. some other platforms or here. I thank you for this opportunity, but I have to switch to my Zoom meeting now. No problem. Thank you so much. God bless. Take Same care. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.